Ok. Pessoal, boa noite. Bem-vindos a mais uma série das nossas palestras de história uh, dos Estados Unidos. Mais uma vez aqui com o nosso querido professor Henrique. Hoje ele vai falar da virada uh, do século XX, do comecinho do século XX, do período de reconstrução e a era de ouro. É... Leandro, por favor, pode falar das intérpretes. Ah, e outra coisa, essa palestra está sendo gravada, quem tiver uh, algum problema, por favor, é, pode se é, manifestar. Ela está sendo gravada, ela vai ficar disponível no YouTube, para vocês poderem assistir depois. Então, boa noite a todos, boa noite pessoal, quem está entrando aqui agora, né? como a Anitta apresentou, hoje o Henrique Carreteiro vai dar sequência às palestras sobre história americana, sobre a virada do século, essa palestra também está disponível em português, quem quiser ouvir traduzida, só clica no ícone de interpretação simultânea, que fica aqui na barra inferior do Zoom, quem não estiver vendo o ícone, que é um globinho, clique em More, que a gente sabe que às vezes ele fica escondido, a interpretação está por conta da Letícia e da Cris, alunas da Especialização em Interpretação Simultânea da Lula. Boa noite, Henrique. Seja muito bem-vindo, viu? Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, I'm going to start uh, this talk um, about the turn of the 20th century, which actually covers the period uh, right after the Civil War, uh, from 1865 until the beginning Uh, and the first years of uh, the 20th century, uh, a little bit before uh, the First World War, okay? So this is a very important uh, period in the history of the United States because it basically um, is the foundation, uh, if we can say so, of these uh, industrialization or this economic boom Uh, that actually made uh, the United States uh, the most powerful uh, country in the world during the 20th century, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's a very important uh, period uh, in history, okay? Um, so if you, for example, wanted to, uh, to do some research uh, on this period, you're going to find uh, that there are different... Uh, topics, like general topics. Um, uh, probably probably uh, the, the two most um, uh, well-known are uh, the Reconstruction and the Gilded Age. So uh, I'm going to briefly uh, talk about uh, these two uh, periods, okay? Uh, right, so I'm going to share my screen. Uh, all right, so um, I need that the host enables me to uh, share my screen, please. Okay, now I, yep, so, right. Da -da. Okay, here. All right. Here we go. So as I said, it's uh, the Reconstruction and the Gilded Age, right? So the Reconstruction that goes from 1865 to 1877, uh, when it officially ended, and uh, the Gilded Age uh, that goes from 1870, roughly, to uh, the beginning of the 20th century. So I've brought these two pictures that are very symbolic, Uh, of the Reconstruction period, former slaves, and uh, what the country, what the Union uh, was going to do uh, with the former uh, Confederate States, what, what uh, the country was going to do with former slaves, how they were going to be protected under the law, uh, how, how the country was going to uh, reunite uh, itself once more, right? And uh, this other picture to uh, the right, which shows uh, these are uh, symbols of the wealth, right? And of these famous tycoons, these famous uh, wealthy people from the 19th century that are famous until today, these names, right? We hear these names, the Vanderbilts, the Astors, uh, the Rockefellers, um, uh, Carnegie, 
uh, you name it, right? There were these, um, uh, it is said, for example, that Andrew Carnegie's um, uh, wealth uh, would have been today more than the double uh, the amount of, of money that Bill Gates has, for example, right? So just for you to, to have an idea of um, how rich they were. Okay, but I'm going to start with the reconstruction. Okay, so we have uh, these two gentlemen here. Um, to the left, uh, former President Abraham Lincoln, and um, to the right, Tadeusz Stevens, right? So uh, Tadeusz Stevens was part of the Republican Party, the same party of President Lincoln, and he was considered to be one of the leaders of the radical movement of, the, of that party at that time. Uh, and actually, uh, the thing is that after, after a war, after any war, the question is set uh, in the sense that uh, the, the winner of the war, what, how is the winner going to treat the defeated part? Um, what are, go are the, the measures that the winner is going to take? Are these measures going to be uh, harsh or soft? Okay, so um, a very well-known example of harsh measures that actually were very harmful for, uh, for everybody, um, uh, were the, the measures of uh, the Versailles Treaty, okay, after uh, the First World War. Uh, so France uh, and England uh, and all the allies after uh, World War I, they were so harsh on Germany that many historians, uh, probably you've heard, uh, they say that um, that was one of the causes that actually allowed movements like the fascist movement in Italy or the national socialist movement in, in, in Germany uh, to emerge, right? And that they basically um, created uh, figures like Adolf Hitler, right? So uh, it's not a simple question. And uh, to the left, we have Abraham Lincoln, who actually, even before uh, the South had surrender, had already planned um, the readmission of the Southern states uh, in a more lenient way. Whereas the radical Republicans were more on the side of harsher measures, all right? So in 1863, Abraham Lincoln uh, announced uh, his proclamation of amnesty and reconstruction, okay? And, uh, one of his ideas was that to readmit former Confederate states into the Union, one of the conditions was that at least 10% of those people from the voting lists, if at least 10% of, the, of them would swear allegiance to the Union, then the state could be readmitted to the Union. All right. Uh, they would have to have new elections, they would have to uh, um, uh, vote for new representatives, uh, and they would have to rewrite uh, their states, uh, state constitutions. Um, however, um, radical Republicans consider that too lenient, okay? They consider that uh, like at least 10% was uh, not enough to punish former slave owners, was not enough um, to um, change uh, uh, the, uh, the country. Um, and in July 1864, Congress passed a bill that proposed that uh, it was going to be them, right? The legislative power, the responsible for the reconstruction and not the executive. One of the things that they were proposing was that uh, instead of at least 10% of uh, the people in voting lists, uh, that 
the southern states would have to at least have the majority of the people in voting lists to swear allegiance to the union to be admitted um, or readmitted to uh, the, the union. Now, uh, that proposal was uh, vetoed. Uh, that, that bill was vetoed by Abraham Lincoln. And that's actually the start of uh, tensions between the executive and the legislative power, okay, as to which one of them was going to be the responsible for the reconstruction of the country. Now, as uh, we all know, uh, President Abraham Lincoln was assassinated in April 1865. And in May of that same year, his vice president, uh, Mr. Andrew Johnson, uh, became the president, um, and um, since he was uh, a southerner that had been the only uh, senator at that time from the South uh, who was in favor of abolition, and uh, he actually had pledged uh, a, 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 a allegiance to the Union, uh, the um, radical Republicans uh, were uh, hoping that he would uh, be on their side. However, they were wrong because uh, President Johnson uh, announced his own reconstruction plan and he was even more lenient than Lincoln's plan. Basically, uh, it was a simple, uh, he, his conditions were just as simple as withdrawing the secession, just swearing allegiance to the union, ratifying the 13th Amendment. So it was very, very soft. And of course, uh, all the Southern states um, actually applied for the readmission. Uh, they uh, called for uh, new elections. They rewrote their, their constitutions and they elected new representatives who were sent to Congress in December, 1865. However, as you might uh, expect, uh, radical Republicans were um, infuriated, right? Because uh, Johnson's plan uh, did not address key issues with, with regards to former slaves. For example, uh, issues regarding the land, voting rights, and their protection under the law. Okay, I'm going to concentrate here on the last two, on, on how uh, Congress uh, uh, worked to uh, protect former slaves uh, under the law and how they uh, worked to give them um, voting rights. Okay, All right. So, um, yeah. What Congress, uh, what were some of the actions that Congress uh, took? Uh, the Freedmen's Bureau, okay, uh, in 1865. The Freedmen's uh, Bureau assisted former slaves and poor whites by distributing clothes and food. Uh, it set up more than 40 hospitals, approximately uh, 4,000 schools, 61 industrial institutes, and 74 teacher training centers. And they also passed the Civil Rights Act uh, of 1866. Okay. In this uh, law, um, they wanted to give African American citiz citizenship and uh, they wanted to forbid states from passing black codes. I'm going to uh, explain what black codes are in a moment, okay? But as you can see, um, that's what um, the legislative power wanted to do. And uh, President Johnson, uh, it seems uh, kind of evident that he saw that as um, uh, you know, uh, as, as, as an example that Congress wanted to uh, take power away from him. So what he did was he vetoed both the Bureau and the Civil Rights Act. 
Now, Congress overrode, uh, he, Congress were, was able to over, override not the Bureau, but the Civil Rights Act. And that's when they draft the 14th Amendment, which made all persons born or naturalized in the United States citizens of the country. Okay? Right. Uh, now, the Black Codes. I was, I was, um, um, I, I said that I was going to mention what the Black Codes uh, were. And the Black Codes are important because they are the base uh, for uh, what we are going to, um, uh, to study uh, later, uh, which is the segregation, uh, uh, segregation in the United States and the civil rights movement uh, um, on the, in the 20th century, uh, in the 1960s, okay? So basically what happens is that when uh, the Southern states were readmitted to the Union, and uh, they were able to write their new constitutions. In their new constitutions, they wrote laws discriminating and segregating Black people. Uh, as a general example, these codes, what they did, they prohibited Black people from carrying weapons, serving on juries, testifying against whites, marrying whites, traveling without permits, among other things. Um, and that's exactly what uh, the legislative power and more specifically the radical Republicans wanted to avoid, okay? Now, um, President Johnson advised Southern states not to ratify the 14th Amendment. Uh, surprising um, action. Uh, and the 14th Amendment was not ratified until July uh, 1868, okay? So this conflict between the legislative and the executive um, made the legislative to uh, open a trial, an impeachment trial against uh, Johnson, which was the first impeachment of the United States, okay? Impeachment trial uh, in May uh, 1868. Now, he fell one vote short of the necessary two-thirds majority for conviction. Uh, he was not, in, uh, in the end, he was not uh, impeached. But, of course, um, there was, he, he did not run for re-election. Uh, he was so criticized that, um, um, you know, he, he, he had no popularity at all, okay? Uh, as you can see, uh, the Reconstruction Plan uh, was difficult, was difficult, was difficult to uh, make the South change. Uh, and it finally, um, well, uh, with the election of 1868, uh, uh, that was won by Ulysses Grant from the Republican uh, Party, the radical Republicans were able to move ahead with the Reconstruction Plan and they introduced the 15th Amendment, uh, which states that no one can be kept from voting because, because of race, color, or previous conditions of, of servitude, right? So we have this three amendments, okay? The 13th Amendment, which we saw last um, in our last um, uh, meeting uh, that uh, prohibited uh, slavery, the 14th that made everybody born or naturalized in the United States uh, citizen, and the 15th, which gave uh, everybody um, the right um, of vote, okay? Good. Now, uh, the, the uh, reconstruction plan, as I was saying, was not, uh, was not an easy thing to do because there was um, uh, there was opposition from from southern states, and because they saw uh, this reconstruction plan as uh, an imposition from the north, uh, so in the election of eighteen seventy seven, which was very disputed, and there were two candidates um, disputing the election as usual, right? A Republican. 
uh, R.B. Hayes and the Democrat S.J. Tilden. What happened was that um, Hayes from the Republican Party uh, won the necessary electoral votes, but not the popular vote. The popular vote was won by the Democrat. Now, um, in Congress, they actually negotiated. The tension was uh, so high that they resolved the conflict through a, ne a negotiation. So the Democrats, okay, allowed, okay, um, quotation marks, they allowed um, the Republicans to inaugurate uh, President Hayes uh, under the condition of signing the termination of the Reconstruction Plan, okay? Um, which, in fact, what happened was that this allowed southern states to enact uh, more discriminatory laws, okay? Um, as if that wasn't enough, there is a series of um, uh, cases, Supreme Court cases, that um, issued sentences in favor of discrimination. The most famous, probably, is the case of Plessy versus Ferguson, okay? Uh, Plessy versus Ferguson uh, is a case in which uh, this gentleman called uh, Homer Plessy, uh, who was considered to be, and this is actually something that I have never understood how they were able to measure and to classify people according to the percentage of black blood that they carried in their veins. That's, that's uh, and, but that existed. So Homer Plessy was considered to be one eighth black and seven eighths white. How they did that, it's still a mystery to me, uh, but that existed. Okay, so uh, he um, was traveling by train within the state of Louisiana, and he got into a, a card uh, for white people. Now, since he was um, one eighth black, and probably he didn't have the appearance of being entirely white, maybe that's why he was he was asked to leave the card. Um, uh, for whites and go to the cards uh, for black people. He refused, he was arrested, he was sent to jail, and he opened a lawsuit against the state um, uh, because uh, he had been discriminated. Now, the judge from the district court um, gave a sentence uh, against Plessy, and uh, that's when he actually took the case to the Supreme Court. He appealed and the case went to the Supreme Court in 1892, okay? The Supreme Court took four years uh, to issue the final, the final um, sentence. And the final sentence was shocking, okay? I'm going to read uh, the final sentence, this is, uh, it's, it's short, okay? Uh, Justice Henry Brown wrote for the majority. There was one dissenting vote from Justice John Marshall Harlan, okay? But the majority uh, in the voice of Henry, uh, Justice Henry Brown wrote the following. The object of the 14th Amendment, uh, if we remember the 14th Amendment was the amendment that considered born or naturalized people in the United States uh, as citizens, okay, was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law. But, okay, it, couldn't, it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality or a common mingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory unsatisfactory to either. 
laws permitting and even requiring their separation in places where they are liable to be brought into contact do not necessarily imply the inferiority of either race to the other. Uh, this has, uh, has, uh, is known as the separate but equal uh, sentence in the sense that uh, if the states would uh, provide uh, the same uh, facilities with the same uh, equality, uh, with the same quality, for example, uh, on a train, carts for white people and with the same uh, quality, but carts for black people, that would be okay, right? Or bathrooms uh, or in a restaurant, areas for whites and areas for blacks, right? Which, um, well, it's, it's, it, it was, uh, you know, the consolidation of segregation. Um, and, uh, well, it's, uh, what can I say? It's, uh, it's, it's so shocking, right? Um, and these laws uh, were, um, you know, being practiced uh, until uh, the 1960s, okay? Uh, when uh, the civil rights movement and people like uh, Martin Luther King uh, as you know, uh, they fought against uh, these um, uh, these laws and this uh, legal, because it was legal segregation, right? Okay, so let's move on to uh, this uh, economic part, okay? Uh, the Gilded Age. As I said uh, before, this is referred to as uh, the, the, the age where um, the uh, uh, economy of the United States grew to a point where uh, it consolidated the country as, uh, you know, the superpower and the most powerful country uh, of the 20th uh, century, right? One of the feats that symbolizes this economic growth and this power was the transcontinental railroad, okay, which was finished or they united the East and the West in 1869, okay? And this is a very uh, interesting picture because it shows uh, allegedly, I mean, uh, the story goes, they say from stanford.edu, uh, 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 that this picture is, uh, you know, the encounter of uh, the Central Pacific Railroad's tracks from the West with the Union Pacific Railroad tracks from the east in Utah, okay, on May the 10th, 1869. So can you imagine it's, uh, you know, uh, not, okay, it's 1870, okay, the 19th century, uh, uniting uh, the, the east and the west, the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean, okay, in this vast amount of territory um, in those years, uh, it's a tremendous feat. So uh, for those who uh, are engineers or are interested in engineering, this is in, uh, like absolutely incredible, an incredible um, fact. Uh, and of course, for an era which is an era of industrialization, uh, it was, uh, you know, so important to uh, transport goods from one side of the country to another side of the country. It was communication. It was, you know, uh, a revolution. Now, um, I brought this um, clip, okay, that shows this and also some of the problems, right, that... Um, uh, the construction uh, of uh, this uh, uh, railroad, um, some of the problems that uh, it brought, okay? Okay, here, All right. It had taken the bloodshed and sacrifice of the Civil War to reunite the nation North and South. But when the war was over, Americans set out with equal determination to unite the nation east and west. To do it, they would build a railroad. 
Its completion would be one of the greatest technological achievements of the age, signaling at last, as nothing else ever had, that the United States was not only a continental nation, but on its way to becoming a world power. And when the railroad was finally built, the pace of change would shift from the steady gait of a team of oxen to the powerful surge of a steam locomotive. The West would be transformed. Overnight, the railroad would turn barren spots of earth into raucous boom towns. North Platte and Julesburg, Abilene, Bear River, Wichita, and Dodge. The railroad would allow Civil War veterans, poor farmers from the East, and landless peasants from Europe to have a farm they could call their own. There, they planted foreign strains of wheat in rich, matted prairie soil that had never known anything but grass. Railroads would carry hundreds of thousands of Western Longhorns to Eastern markets and turn the dusty, saddle-sore men who herded them into the idols of every Eastern schoolboy. Okay, so um, a quick word about uh, the cowboys, which have been romanticized uh, since that time, and especially by um, Hollywood movies. So it, uh, it was not an easy life. Um, so the life of a cowboy, they worked between 10 to 12 hours a day on a ranch, plus other eight to 10 hours on the trail. Uh, they had to be alert at all times for dangers, um, not to mention uh, that sometimes they had to fight indigenous people and that those indigenous peoples uh, uh, were being displaced uh, with all this, uh, the construction of the railroad and the migration you know, of, of, of people to the West, uh, their territories uh, were being occupied and they were being displaced. Um, well, some cowboys were as young as 15. Most were broken down by the time they were 40 years old uh, because uh, most of the time they would be in the saddle from dawn until dusk and they would sleep on the ground they would have to bathe in rivers. So this brings this other part of progress, okay? Uh, which is uh, the conditions, the working conditions or the conditions um, uh, um, under which workers, you know, um, worked, how they were treated. Not only cowboys, but um, workers in factories in, in the cities, uh, uh, migrants, um, they, uh, th th there is this whole, uh, uh, you know, list of abuses committed by uh, industrialism um, uh, in, in those, uh, in, at that time, which actually uh, helped the emergence of uh, the socialist movement uh, we can't forget, for example, that in Europe, because this was not happening only in the United States, it was happening in Europe as well. Um, uh, Karl Marx and uh, Engels, they uh, released the Communist Manifesto in 1848. Uh, and Karl Marx publishes uh, The Capital in 1865, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, it's roughly around these years. Um, well, uh, let's um, continue. And railroads would bring onto the Great Plains the buffalo hunters. 
who would drive a magnificent animal that symbolized the West to the brink of extinction. And with it, a way of life with roots reaching back before recorded history. The railroad would do all of that. But first, someone would have to build it. Okay, well, I liked that uh, video because it also mentions um, uh, 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 problems like the extinction or uh, nearly extinction of the buffalo. Um, Uh, environmental issues okay right so um, looking at a map of the United States at that time uh, we can see I don't know if it, it's uh, if you can are able to to see uh, well but in red we have the railroads by 1890 right so basically all the west and part of the midwest uh, but railroads um, uh, before uh, before that time, by 1870, uh, are in uh, in green. Okay, so can it's it's actually incredible. It's uh, uh you know by the end of the 19th century to have you know all this infrastructure in one country was uh, was amazing. Okay, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh it's impossible to. I mean, if we consider. Uh, what is known as Latin America, like from Mexico to uh, Argentina and Chile, right? Um, uh, we actually, uh, Latin America was, was uh, a baby in terms of industrial growth, right? So uh, uh, Latin America, in like in fact, um, started the industrialization uh, uh, movement in the 20th century, right? Um, not in the 19th century, okay? Right. Uh, among the railroad workers, many Chinese, and I brought this picture because it's interesting uh, to, uh, to, to be aware that uh, migration to the United States uh, in the 19th century was... Uh, enormous people from uh, all parts of the world, not only from Europe, but also from Asia, went to the United States. And I'm not going to show that clip, um, but uh, I always uh, make this presentation available. So if you want to to have it, uh, just uh, let uh, let us know. Let Jessica know. Write your your email um, your email address. Uh, and she will send it to you, but you can watch uh, the clip. Uh, there is this professor from Stanford University, I believe he is from Chinese origin, and he actually uh, points uh, at the fact that uh, normally history has been understood and has, has been uh, read uh, through the eyes of great men, right? Great men, great feats, uh, but it's becoming more and more common to look at history from those who really did the job, right? Who did the work, the workers, okay? So um, uh, that's why, actually, I've brought uh, the, two, the two sides, okay? Now, uh, this is a cartoon. Um, made in 1879 by Joseph uh, Kepler, the cartoonist, that shows uh, William Vanderbilt, uh, bottom right, Jay Gould and Cyrus Fields here, the owners of three of the major railroad companies, Union Pacific, New York Central, and Lakeshore and Dependence Lines, okay? They are, uh, in, they are uh, imitating the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the seven uh, wonders of the ancient world, okay, symbolizing power. And why? Because they formed a trust. And what is a trust? A trust is, uh, we, uh, it's not exactly the same, but it's similar to a cartel. 
Uh, and a cartel uh, or a trust is nothing but uh, the uh, players of this players of the same industry, for example, of the oil industry, they come together, they form a group, and they work together as if they were one uh, company, right? Uh, the uh, most uh, um, uh, one of the worst uh, um, uh, consequences is that the, they dictate the prices, right? Um, there's no uh, no competition, basically. Okay. Uh, right. Um, here you have some links of um, uh, the uh, atrocious working conditions of um, um, workers in the 19th century. Okay. Um, I'm not going to uh, play. Uh, there's one video and some images. I'm not going to do that now because I have some more information about um, the Gilded Age. Um, but I've brought uh, the picture of Eugene Debs, uh, which was uh, an American, a socialist American, because yes, there was a socialist party in the United States uh, at the beginning uh, of the century. Uh, and uh, he always fought for improving the condition of workers in the United States. He was a candidate to the presidency in 1912, as you can see in this poster to the left, Eugene Debs for president and Emil Seidel for, for vice president. And he didn't win, but he got nearly 1 million votes at that time, which was, um, which was a lot at that time. Um, well, let's take a, let's, let's, uh, talk a little bit about this, uh, uh, magnets, these tycoons, right? Andrew Carnegie, um, the owner of a steel company. Okay. Um, um, and I brought this, uh, footage, which is very interesting because it shows him... <laughs> Okay, uh, in uh, Belgium, in Brussels, at the International Museum, it's him in the middle. Okay, I brought this because I think it's so interesting to to watch these footages from 1913. Um, he is being, you know, uh, sh shown around, and uh, well. Um, yeah, I think it's it's so it's a, such a beautiful uh, image, right? Um, but well, how did he uh, become uh, rich? Well, he had the steel um, the steel company, uh, but he did something that is known uh, today as uh, the vertical and horizontal uh, integration. So what is vertical integration? Vertical in integration is when a company buys uh, the uh, companies that provide them with raw material and also the companies that distributes their products. So he was the owner of probably mines of iron in order to make the steel and also some distribution channels uh, to get to the markets and sell the steel. So that is considered to be a monopoly, right? When you have control of everything. If you have control of everything, you can uh, set the price that you want. You control, you control the market, basically, okay? Now, there are, uh, today, there are laws that uh, protect uh, the countries uh, from uh, these monopolies. Um, but these uh, laws actually were passed um, after uh, these uh, companies in, in these years uh, had already become um, uh, monopolies, right? Uh, right, the homestead, uh, homestead strike. Uh, in one of his um, factories, uh, there was this strike 
uh, and um, he was not uh, in the United States at that time. He was in Europe, but he actually gave the order to uh, the administrator uh, of that time to um, to hire private agents that actually went into the factory to um, to avoid the strikers to get into the factory. Uh, but it was uh, a real fight with with guns and the strikers fought back and uh, there was fire and there was uh, um, um, dead people. Three uh, agents uh, died and uh, it seems that at least seven strikers were were actually killed uh, in, in this uh, riot. So uh, the tensions between workers and um, and uh, the um, company owners uh, were were real and were um, uh, you know uh, um, they they actually um, made uh, workers unite, uh, create unions and fight for um, better conditions and for improving uh, their their own lives. Um, John Rockefeller, um, this is in the oil business. Um, his company Standard Oil of Ohio processed two or three percent of the country's crude oil. Uh, by 1882, he formed the first trust. Okay, as uh, I've uh, I said before, the trust is uh, similar to a cartel, and by doing so, he forced consumers to pay whatever price he wanted to charge for his oil, according to Encyclopedia.com. Okay, um, because of that, um, pr uh, there was. Uh, uh, pressure in Congress to pass a law uh, against the formation of trusts, okay? Uh, and in 1819, uh, President uh, Benjamin Harrison passed the Sherman Anti Antitrust Act. So Sherman, because uh, it, it was in the honor of the congressman uh, that um, uh, proposed uh, this, uh, this bill. OK, and the Sherman Antitrust Act made trusts and monopolies uh, illegal. OK, now um, I brought this clip um, that talks about that. And it's an interesting clip because even though it was filmed at the beginning uh, of the 20th century in black and white, it has been colored. So we are going to uh, to be able to see John Rockefeller and his son, um, you know, in color, which is interesting. And it's going to talk about uh, how they wanted to clean their Im image by doing what? Okay, so these two gentlemen, John Rockefeller and C Andrew Carnegie, they are known actually uh, for philanthropy, okay? for having given away their fortunes uh, for philanthropic causes. Now, this uh, clip uh, addresses the issue that um, they, they just wanted to be seen as good when in fact they had not been, okay? Uh, let's take a look. In the 19th century, millions crossed the ocean seeking freedom and opportunity. They find a country starkly divided between the haves and the have-nots. Between 1860 and 1900, the richest 2% of American families own one-third of the nation's wealth. These bare-knuckled businessmen rule industry, Wall Street, and Washington. The most powerful of all, oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller, the world's first billionaire. 
His company, Standard Oil, savages and then swallows up its competitors and ends up controlling 90% of the American oil industry. By 1896, he has assets of $200 million, over $5 billion in today's money. Rockefeller and his fellow robber barons are not loved. Ordinary Americans resent their wealth and power. Oil tycoon John D. Rockefeller, his son, John Jr., decide to redeem their public image. John Sr., to win American hearts and minds, publicizes his philanthropy. By now, he has already given away around $150 million. Over $4 billion today. With his trademark cap, John Sr. appears more often in front of the cameras. Crowds like this one welcoming him at a Florida railroad station treat him warmly. The strategy pays off. Americans start to associate the Rockefellers less with ruthless business practices and more with good works. Thanks to film, audiences can now see the lifestyles of the rich and famous. The robber barons become celebrities. Okay, so, uh, yep, uh, that's what I had for, uh, for you today, right? Um, so if you have any questions, comments, uh, I'm open to answer uh, any of them. It was great. Incredible, wonderful. Okay, no, okay, but to know and details, no questions, but it's delightful, right? Listening to you and all the work you do, it's it's wonderful. Thank you a lot. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Leiden. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, uh, yeah, that's all. Um, so uh, take care of yourselves. Uh, have a, a great evening, and see you. Uh, on the week of uh, this, actually the 6th of September, not the 7th, okay? Because the 7th is a holiday. Uh, so um, if I'm not mistaken, uh, because I think it, it has to be confirmed, uh, right, Anita? Uh, whether it's I going to be think it's going to be on the 5th. If I'm on not... the 5th? Yes, on the 5th, on Tuesday the 5th. Tuesday the 5th. Uh, okay. Yeah, All but right. uh, we, we confirmed that later because on Wednesday, people are going to travel for the holidays and everything. Okay. And uh, on Wednesday, there are the classes. And But we confirm. Probably All it's right. going to be on Tuesday the 5th. Okay? Okay. And to be confirmed. It would be, yes. yes, it would be um, the First World War. That's yes. very interesting. Okay. Okay, right. so... Um, Anyone else? So, uh, pessoal, muito obrigada mais uma vez por todos que estão aqui. Lembrando que a palestra fica disponível no YouTube uh, para quem não conseguiu assistir, para quem quer assistir de novo, para quem quer assistir as anteriores do professor Henrique. E a gente espera vocês na próxima palestra. Muito obrigada. <música>